Jeff, Mike, and I again would like to thank you for being part of our Trails to the Washita podcast series. Today, we'd like to finish our interview with you on Conflict on the Kansas Frontier, Part 2. In Part 1, we examined how the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 predicted the buffalo population would be gone within 20 years, and how treaties like Fort Lyon and Little Arkansas allowed the Indians to continue to hunt the buffalo, sparking further clashes with homesteaders. Jeff, you also outlined the Indian depredation claims process and how they offer unique insights into the actions of Black Kettle, the Cheyenne leader. Today, we would like to further these stories by starting with the August 1868 raids. From the South Fork of the Solomon, Black Kettle's band rode to the North Fork, where they received a warm welcome. Having been warned of their hostility, a group of settlers opened fire when the raiders came into range. But the Indians, evidently wanting no part of an even fight, circled the frontiersmen for a time and then moved away. In their retreat, the warriors killed one settler. As they swept through the settlements, they killed three men and one woman and took two little girls named Belle prisoners. The party then turned south toward the Saline, leaving in their wake on the Solomon, 15 dead and many destroyed houses. Jeff, can you give us some insight on the Solomon raids? especially breaking down the capture of the Bell Girls. Also, there seems to be some historical corrections on when Miss Anna Morgan and Sarah White were captured and by whom. Yes, this is an excellent question because it allows me to follow up on my last question because this is, it's in the history books. It's the Count of Little Rock, who after the raids were reported, Agent Winecoop got with Little Rock and he was basically the, the highest chief under Black Kettle, but he was Black Kettle's village. And six, 16 chiefs were killed at the Washita, including Little Rock. And so he went among the Indians and he interviewed them. And then he sat down with Agent Winecoop and an officer and an interpreter and I think another Indian and a witness. And he narrated to him what the Indians told him happened. And that's where we get the South Fork and North Fork story. There's no raids up there that can be found of anybody killed or anything. It's where Beloit, Kansas is, which is about 20 miles into those two rivers being the Solomon River. And that's where it started. And it started on August 12th. And if you, if you read the, uh, the adjutant general of the state of Kansas's report on this, he talks about the Indians throwing their coffee that was served in tin cups into the face of Elizabeth Bell. Elizabeth Bell ended up being shot and raped multiple times, and she died between two and three weeks later from her wounds. It, it went through her lung, and she died at the Port Harker Hospital. She was one of, one of the dead, and uh, she was married to Braxton Bell. Uh, Braxton shared a home with, with his sister, Mary Bell, who was married to David Bogardus, and they had a a baby and an eight-year-old boy, eight- or nine-year-old boy. Uh, Elizabeth and, and Braxton Bell had an 11-month-old girl, Ella. And now the Bell family was a large family. The parents were out there, and all of the children were e- either married or about ready to get married. And there were sisters there. There were other brothers. And Aaron Bell was the dad of the two little Bell girls who were captured at the Bogardus Bell home on August 12th, just east of today's Beloit. They came upon the scene there, and they were greeted friendly, and they served them coffee in the cups and was thrown back in the face of Elizabeth Bell. That's confirmed in the depredation claim of the the statements of the survivors, and also in the Adjutant General's report. This is where this originated, and it was on August 12th. And they, this, this is how they killed the two men. And it comes in the depredation claims by the eyewitnesses. They were ordered to run around the house and they were being whipped while they did it. Uh, David Bogardus put his hands up to protect himself and turned towards him and they shot him dead in front of his children and his wife. Uh, Braxton Bell didn't do that, but he's holding his daughter. He's trying to protect his daughter. And after running around a few times and being whipped as they run around the house, he's shot dead. And an Indian on a horse uh, with a long uh, crew stick, spear stick or whatever, poked the little baby's face uh, numerous times. 
uh, one of the aunts raised her, and in the depredation claim, she says that Ella, she raised her till she was married, and she still has all the scars on her face that that Indian thrust in her. And they had to pry that baby out from the from the arms of her dead father. Then they tried to take Elizabeth Bell captive. Now, mind you, she's been raped by all of those there already. They're done with all that. And they put her on a horse, and the accounts say she either tried to jump off or fell off at whatever happened and go back into the house. I think it was to get her daughter because her daughter wasn't with her and she wanted to get her daughter. They shot her and raped her again while she was laying down there. Uh, that, that's, that's the account of the eyewitnesses. The two little girls, uh, uh, Esther and Margaret, and they were eight and six, were taken captive. And two days later, they are down on August 15th, back down on the Saline River, just at about where Spillman Creek uh, goes into the Saline there, just west of present-day Lincoln, when, by a coincidence, Captain Benteen had been sent up, and they either stayed from Fort Zara or, or Fort Harker. I, I think it was Fort Harker myself. But at any rate, he comes up with his company and coincidentally runs into these Indians on the Saline and chases them. For about 15 miles, they cross and crisscross and crisscross. And anyway, after they've gone for a couple of miles and they're chasing, and the reason why the Indians are crossing the creek, one settler joined them, and he uh, wrote that they crossed the creek at least 15 times. But that was to get the get distance from them, you know, cross the creek and then go that side, follow the creek. Well, the cavalry crossed, so cross the creek again. They were trying to slow down the cavalry. Uh, a few uh, Cheyenne were killed in that, but... Also, at, at about where Spillman Creek, about a, a mile west of that, they released the two uh, little girls. Benton spoke to them. And, and they say that in their, in their testimony. And it, the eight-year-old gives her testimony in the depredation claim. And she says, Captain Benteen told them, just follow the river and you'll be safe. Meaning, follow the river down because you get the settlement. Well, they were out there for two days. You know, on the prairie where there was wolves and everything, and a settler found them two days later, took them to his house, Mark Hendrickson. Uh, they ended up down at, at uh, Fort Harker and were finally rescued by, by their father. But this was just the Bell family, okay? Their other Bell relatives had their houses destroyed, but nobody was injured. There was a Thompson family that also had a large number of people living there and the parents with them. And their two brothers were killed on August 14th after all uh, come together at one house on Asher Creek, Asherville, Kansas, today, about five miles east of Beloit. Uh, they stayed there. They went out to check on their own home, and the Indians came out of their home and killed them at, within sight of their parents and stuff, and they laid there on the ground until Governor Crawford arrived and, and, and relieved them. So we had these victims. We had a Randall killed. You also asked him the question about the capture of Anna Morgan and uh, Sarah White. Sarah White was captured on August 13th, and that uh, that is the day before, you know, the 14th, where all that other stuff, as I said, uh, happened. But anyway, she was captured by Cheyenne. Her father was killed, was working about three miles away on the Republican River with his sons, and the sons escaped, but the father was killed, and their house was destroyed. The mother got away with some other little girls and hid. In, in a creek bed, and Sarah was captured. She was 17 years old. And so uh, then it was two months later. This was August 13th. Two months later, on October 13th, Anna Morgan is captured near where today's uh, Delphus, Kansas is, which is uh, east of Lincoln. And there were several others killed then. Uh, the Smith family uh, really suffered terribly in that. A father and son were killed, and uh, others were killed. And so there, there was a little uh, eight-year-old boy killed where today's uh, Glasgow is, and Benjamin Meisel. He was running. His, they lived in a dugout with his older brother and his father, and his father was helping someone a couple miles away with their harvest. Uh, when the Indians raided them, and they were running to a neighbor's when a, when an Indian ran up to the little boy and shot him dead. It's in no newspaper. It's in a depredation claim from an eyewitness who saw it. That is the other house that the other boy was running to when they gave their testimony in the depredation claim for his father, for the destruction of everything in his dugout.
when Sarah was captured in that raid in, in uh, October 13, was led by Oglala. And she says so in her depredation claim. Uh, well, the depredation claim is actually filed by her husband, James. And he's under oath saying that my wife told me that she was captured by Sue. And one month later, and that is just two weeks before the fight at the Washita, she was traded to the Cheyenne and joined uh, uh, captivity with Sarah White. So uh, when it was all over, there was a, a Bertosh family. That's the one I think I was mentioning earlier about well, on the Buffalo, where the father was going out to celebrate the birth of his three-year-old boy, and he took his 16-year-old boy with him, or actually took a neighbor whose 16-year-old boy uh, had a 16-year-old boy. And that's the boy that was wounded and got back. Uh, both mothers were raped and found in their homes. They don't admit it in their depredation claims. They avoid that, but a newspaper article uh, notes it. And mind you, this is a plunder opportunity. They're not going to turn down an opportunity to rape a woman when they've captured them. So when it was over, at least 15 people were killed up on the Solomon. And that doesn't include the seven or so that were killed in um, October. So according to the Washita Battlefield Oklahoma National Parks website, states that in September of 1868, with General Philip Sheridan's blessings, Lieutenant Colonel Alfred H. Sully led 500 men, nine companies of the 7th U.S. Cavalry, and Company F of the 3rd U.S. Infantry out of Fort Dodge into Indian Territory. His orders were to find and punish those hostiles responsible for the raids in Kansas during the summer of 1868. On September 12th, along the banks of Wolf Creek, Sully and his men faced a large force of Kiowas, Comanche, and Cheyenne. The Indians had made false trails in the sand to set up a trap for the cavalrymen. And to make matters worse, Sully needed help coordinating wagon train and troop movements when he did engage the warriors. In the end, Sully returned to Fort Dodge, Kansas, despite criticism from his officers. He was further vilified for having conducted this campaign in an army ambulance. On the trip back to Fort Dodge, Sully's troops were harassed by warriors the entire way. Some historians, including yourself, say that Sully wrote a misinformed report on August 19th in Lincoln County, Kansas, at the Shermerhorn Ranch, where he mentioned the raid starting August 10th. Mrs. Bacon, and two other women. What was in the report, and why this report may have led to General Sheridan's permission to find and punish those hostiles responsible for the 1868 raids in Kansas? Well, first, let me say that that the report was contrary to actually what General Sheridan did to punish the hostiles responsible, because in the report, Sully said it's his opinion that the Indians responsible for this raid, probably no more than maybe two or three dozen, are not affiliated with any particular band, but came down from the north side of the Platte. In other words, if they were Cheyenne, they were northern Cheyenne, and uh, not Black Kettle, southern Cheyenne. And see, some historians who have a hard time understanding historiography and critical thinking skills, and I won't say their names, think that this report is a game changer because they speculate that when the report was given to Sheridan, and it was, by the way, as you noted correctly, it was written August 19th at the Shimmerhorn Ranch. Uh, That's a place where I stay, by the way, when I do my research out in Lincoln, Kansas. I'm very good friends with a family whose ancestors bought the ranch in the 1890s. So this is where Sheridan signed up the scouts for Beecher Island. And uh, this is where Sully was, where he wrote that report on August 19th. While he's writing that report on August 19th, by the way, Wine Coop is having his interview with Little Rock on August 19th. So you see that. And then he reports that the women who were brought to the Shimmerhorn Ranch, uh, Mrs. Shaw, her 16-year-old sister, Miss Foster, and Mrs. Bacon, they were attacked by rogue Indians, and several white men were with them. So these historians speculate that these white men were horse thieves from Oklahoma Territory, uh, Indian Territory, coming up into Kansas to steal horses with some rogue Indians to make it look like an Indian raid. Couldn't be farther from the truth. There isn't a single document to support that. But at any rate, that's what they say. So in 
what, what you have to do is, as I say in my uh, book, Indian Raids and Massacres, Essays on the Central Plains Indian War, where I deconstruct Tilly's letter and break it down and show what was truthful in what he said and what wasn't truthful in what he said, uh, what he was speculating correctly and incorrectly, there I, I use the Indian depredation claims because these give much more uh, information. For uh, Simeon Shah filed a claim uh, for what happened at his house, and David Bacon fired a filed a claim for what happened at his house. And Mrs. Bacon, who was 22 years old, when those three Indians came into her cabin in the afternoon of August 10th, the early afternoon, one was red nose and had a big red nose painted, his nose painted red. Uh, one was an Arapaho, one was a Cheyenne, one was a Lakota. They all three spoke good English and told them who they were. And then her husband was outside in the field uh, within shouting distance because as uh, she said in her sworn statement that uh, one of the Indians started looking in the cupboards and she said, please don't break my dishes. And they saw a, a pistol in there and they grabbed it. And at that time she screamed and yelled for her husband. So one Indian went out and chased the husband off by pointing his weapon at him. And he ran all the way to the Shimmerhorn Ranch. That's about 18 miles. Uh, never came back. And uh, then when as Mrs. Bacon reports, when that Indian came back, the other two Indians had taken turns raping her, and then that Indian raped her, and then they destroyed everything. Now, when she's found the next day, she had what was called only wearing a bodice, I think is what it's called. I had to look it up. I use the Oxford University Dictionary whenever I come across any language from the 19th century that I don't know what it means. That was the, the white rope on your skirt, on your, your cloth skirt on the inside, you know, your undergarments. That's all she was wearing. She had her boy, who was going to be William, who was going to turn two in a week. And what I've only recently discovered, it's not in my Indian Raids and Massacres, but it will be in my next book, which I'm working on, which will be on Beecher Island, um, where I'll go into more detail in these raids. She was five months pregnant with her her second child. So Sheridan writes a report, and he says about this, and he says, the 40th savage, after violating the woman, stuck a saber up her person in a fiendish manner. And of course, one of those historians wrote an article and uh, said that there's no evidence for that at all. But interesting, uh, Hayes, uh, the founder of Hayes, W.E. Webb, wrote a book in 1872 called Buffalo Land. And I learned long ago when I was working on my doctorate that whenever you study a book, you make your own index in the back. And so I was looking through that book and doing some research recently, a year ago, and I wrote down Mrs. Bacon. So I turned to that page, I think it was page 140 in that book. And there uh, is a conversation that Webb had with Sheridan, who had came in, come into his camp uh, and, and had sat down with him and was talking about the Indian raids on Spillman Creek. And he uh, mentioned that the that the last uh, Indian who raped her stuck a rusty saber up her person. And Webb thought that it killed the uh, fetus. But the Indian depredation claim, after after the raids and all that, her husband abandoned her. And she went back to Illinois to live with her dad. And he writes a letter in early January 1869 to the uh, government asking for the compensation to help with his daughter. And he says, as I write this, she is living with me here and has a two-year-old child and a child three weeks old. And uh, I did some genealogical research and found out, found a descendant. She was born December 18th, 1869. So th that's very interesting. And there is confirmation to Sheridan's report, which uh, these other historians want to say, that Sheridan's just wanting to wage a war on a, against an unjust enemy. That is black cattle. It's not his people that did this. It's northern ones that did it. And that's, no, that's not. Well, they also said that um, that the letter was suppressed by uh, by Sheridan so he could attack uh, black cattle, uh, suppressed by it. And so the newspapers never got it. The letters reported on August 25th in one newspaper. I have it in my book, uh, In the Rain to Massacres, and, and note that. And uh, so, no, it wasn't uh, suppressed. And then they, they go on to say that, and it was intentionally misfiled in the National Archives. Oh, no, I found it exactly where it's supposed to be. Uh, it was quoted in Jerry Green's book on the Washita, 
which is considered the uh, the best source to read if you want to read about. It. So you see, Sully was he didn't know and uh, what was going on in the affidavit of Mary Jane Bacon. She went under oath, and it's ten pages handwritten of what happened. And uh, it's all investigated by both the Kansas commissioner, a uh, special commission appointed to look at the uh, depredation claims where there were, uh, I think it was about 50 different people that were affected in those raids. And then the commissioner of Indian affairs both confirmed in their summaries on her uh, file that she was raped by no less than 60 warriors. And, and of course, Sheridan says 40, but uh, they were, they were treated horribly that one when when she left her house, the Indians went in the direction of the Shaw house. So she went in the opposite direction, where it's about two and a half miles to the next neighbor. But she only had gone a little bit when the Indians caught her. And new Indians, these are the Indians that had been at the Shaw house. And they came down and raped her. This is where she got all of those rapes and all that. And then she was brought to the Shaw house herself, where everything in there, in the letter that that Sully writes about, he says that one of the Indians, one of the persons spoke in clear English and looked in his trunk and found his wedding certificate of Shaw and said, I guess you won't be needing this anymore and laughed and then set it on all on fire. But in the depredation claim, uh, Simeon Shaw speaks about the Indians destroying everything and then trying to set the trunk on fire where that was in. And they closed the lid so it went out uh, and didn't burn that stuff in there. So he was able to save that. But also he separated from his wife, too, and nobody knows whatever happened to her and her sister. But when he's filing the depredation claim, it get, they get refiled in the 1880s because Congress reopens them because so many claims were turned down for technicalities. One is you had to be an American citizen. And most of these people that were attacked were had just come over from Scandinavia, England, you know, Ireland, Germany, and they hadn't got their papers yet. So the Congress refiled them in the 1880s, and over 6,000 new claims came out. And this is where you find the Shaw and Bacon claim refiled. And there's more addition there, additional information. But uh, in the Shaw claim, it says that at the time that they're filing that, that the uh, 16-year-old girl is now dead, and he doesn't know where his ex-wife was. He has no idea where she is. He had left her. And he'd moved up uh, on the Solomon, on one of those forks near Lovewell. So that's where he, he left the whole area, left his wife and everything. But that, um, that that's pretty interesting about that letter, how some historians are trying to give significance to it. And what you have to do is you have to lay these things aside, all the other sources, and you have to find out what the truth is. You have to realize that I think Little Rock was sincere in what he was told and reporting to Winecoop, but there was no North and South Fork rating on the Solomon. But you read the books about it. They used his report. Well, why don't they use Edmund Greer's report, which was an affidavit? He was a half-blood. Uh, and he was uh, working with the cavalry as a scout and interpreter and stuff like that, but living with the Cheyenne, marrying with them. And he, he said that he and George Bent, under affidavit, were with the warring parties. So there's two people that look like white people that can speak English. And he also identified five chiefs who led the raids, and he names them. One of them is Bull Bear, dog soldier who led the raids on the Plum Creek Massacre in 1864, and is pictured next to... Uh, Black Kettle, and the only picture taken of Black Kettle in the Camp Weld Conference in late September 1864 before the Washita. He was in on everything from the get-go. And that is more support that Black Kettle was working on both sides. And that's the way I took care of Black Kettle in, in my book, Indian Rage and Massacres. He's, he was caught in the middle. I think he sincerely wanted peace, but he was also an Indian first, and he was an important chief. And so his blood lies with his Indians. So he, he worked both sides. And uh, um, it, it's regretful. But um, it, at any rate, so one other, let me say one other thing about Sully, though. A lot of people don't know. There was a professor at the University of Colorado. I, I met him. I was at a conference with him where he spoke and I spoke. Vine Deloria, Jr. And his famous book in the 60s was uh, Custer Died for Your Sins. And it's an Indian view things, kind of polemical, but he was a real nice guy, I understand, from those who, who knew him. His great-grandfather was Sully. His uh, aunt was Sully's granddaughter, and she wrote novels. She's well-known. So Sully himself married into the uh, 
into the uh, Cheyenne tribe. Or that was Lakota. He married Lakota. Yeah. Well, that is interesting, Jeff. That's uh, that's a great place to end, actually. We're sort of running out of time here. But before we close, I would like to let our audience know how they could purchase one of your autograph books. Yeah, that, thank you for uh, saying that. And just real quickly, let me tell you that I got surprised about a year after my last book came out when somebody posted on my Facebook. They can get me on my Facebook, Jeff Broom. Just send me a message. You don't have to be friends with me. Send me a message. I'd like to know about your books, getting signed copies, and I'll explain everything there. That's the best way to get a hold of me. But uh, a ranger there gave this uh, short review of my book, Indian Raids and Massacres. This is a ranger at the Washita Historic Site. So we're talking about the trails to the Washita. Listen to, listen to what Ranger Joel Shockey wrote. This book debunks age-old myths and deals with the facts about the Indian raids in Colorado, Kansas, and Nebraska that would lead up to the Battle of the Washita and the Battle of Summit Springs. Broom delves into the standard stories and then investigates firsthand source materials to peel away the fiction and find the true facts. I feel this is a must-read for anyone who is really interested in studying the Indian Wars of the Central and Southern Plains. It already has a spot on my bookshelf next to Green's Washita book. So that's where you can get my book from me uh, by contacting me that way. That's it for now. If you'd like to purchase any of Jeff's books, you can check out the links on the description page of this podcast. Remember to check out our Wild West podcast shows on iTunes or wildwestpodcast.buzzsprout.com. You can also catch us on Facebook at facebook.com slash wildwestpodcast or on our YouTube channel at Wild West Podcast, Mike King, YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to our shows listed at the end of the description text of this podcast to receive notification on all new episodes. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any comments or want to add to our series, please write us at wildwestpodcast at gmail.com. We will share your thoughts as they apply to future episodes. Stay tuned next time as we bring you part four, Trails to the Washita, Establishing Camp Supply. <laughs>